I'm delighted to be here at this wonderful symposium, and I am absolutely delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Kara Gubbins, who I had the pleasure to meet uh, through her Animal Communicator and Healer Summit that I was a part of for a few years, including this year. And I am so impressed with uh, Kara. She has a beautiful connection, presence for all beings. I noticed in her interviewing dozens of people for this uh, symposium, her Animal Communicator and Healer Summit, that she was always present for each one. There was no mechanicalness. Uh, she was always uh, dedicated um, to listening, deep listening. And from that, even though I hadn't known her before, I knew that she was a great animal communicator <laughs> because what it takes and the foundation of it is presence. And she is loaded with deep spiritual presence. I am a very, very pleased because uh, Kara's work and the work of all the younger animal communicators, the generations after me, uh, is really fantastic. And I feel just really pleased that um, my vision has been realized, is being realized by so, so many people. And Kara also has a fantastic academic background. Um, she's been doing research since um, she was in high school, scientific research. And she has a bachelor's and master's and PhD in uh, biology. Her PhD in, is in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology. She's a very tuned in person to what's going on in the natural world. So she's um, been published in peer reviewed journals. And she has also completed a master's degree in spiritual psychology. Uh, all of this uh, is part of her deep work, both with humans and animals. She has been um, a professional animal communicator for a decade, uh, over a decade, actually 12 years. And she is uh, the host of this incredible animal communication and healer summit that reaches thousands of people around the world. Big work. I'm so pleased with Kara's work and that I get to know her and be uh, a part of this uh, beautiful forward motion in our field of interspecies telepathic communication. So I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Kara Governs. <laughs> Thank you so much, Penelope. It, it's such an honor to uh, hear you speak about me, and it's such an honor to be here. And um, I want to start by thanking Cheryl for setting the tone um, inside my being today that really aligned me with the truth of who we all are. And that's what I want to really talk about today is truth and what truth is for each of us. But I'm going to start with a question. And my question is, have you ever had a dream? And when I was a kid, my dream was to be Jacques Cousteau. I was going to grow up and swim with the dolphins. I was going to figure out what humpback whales were saying in their songs. I was gonna communicate with all of life. And so this dream led me to a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD in biology. And when I graduated after my PhD, I was, I was 30 something. <laughs> this was a long dream. And I felt a little bit let down. I felt a little bit like, huh, now what? I had had my whole life planned out, and there I was on the edge, on the precipice of my dream coming true. I was a scientist. I had degrees. I had won awards for the science I had done, and yet it felt really empty. And so 
I went through a period of feeling quite lost until one day I found myself driving alone in West Marin. And if any of you know Northern California, West Marin is a very rural area and, um, and it's beautiful country. It's rolling hills next to the ocean and uh, mountains on the other side. And I was driving alone on highway one and off to my left was a field. And in that field were three horses and they were just being horses. They were eating the grass. They were doing whatever horses do. And I found myself sobbing. And there were just tears rolling down my face. And there was a longing inside of me, a longing to know what it was like to be a horse. And then I had to laugh because I was allergic to horses at the time. <laughs> And I was like, horses, Kara, why horses? <laughs> sure, if it was a dolphin, I totally get it. Cry all you want. I was a dolphin lover from the time I was a child. But horses, what was up with that? And I, I drove on and it came to me. I had a deeper dream before my dream to be Jacques Cousteau. My dream was to be Dr. Doolittle to talk to animals, to walk with the animals, to talk to the animals, to share their messages. And as a child, I was told that I was making things up, that that wasn't a real dream, that that wasn't real, that wasn't possible. And so I took the next best dream <laughs> to be Jacques Cousteau and swim with the dolphins. And that's what drove my life. But here I was now in my thirties, with this childhood dream. And I had no idea what to do with this dream. So my next question for you is, what do you do when you have a dream that feels impossible, that feels overwhelming? And I really want you to take a moment and think about that. Have you had a dream that felt impossible, that felt overwhelming? And my response to that dream <laughs> was to get too busy to deal with it. And it really worked for me for about eight years. I finished my PhD, I got married, I started a family, I moved across the country from Florida to California, I bought a house, I got a job, I started teaching college biology at Butte College in Northern California. And that grew into teaching student success workshops. And that grew into teaching student success courses. And as part of being in this academic community, I started participating in professional development workshops for myself because I was trained as a biologist. I was not trained as a teacher. <laughs> and so I needed all the help I could get. So, some of my colleagues recommended this weekend workshop called On Course. And On Course was developed by Skip Downing and it, he was a um, community college English instructor. And so I went down to San Francisco and I attended this weekend workshop. And on the Saturday evening of the workshop, they had what they called the right-brained lesson. Um, it was a little bit different and it was really designed to get you in touch with what was driving you, what was your dream. And so we actually created a dream drawing. And I didn't know what was going to come up when I did this. We just kind of went into this very quiet place. We had pillows and comfy chairs and we were sitting on the floor. And, and um, Jonathan, who was our facilitator, said, what would your life look like? if all of your dreams had come true. And so here I was at least eight years out from that moment with the horses and I still had this dream. And so I just started drawing. And what I drew was a picture of myself surrounded by people off to my left were dolphins. And I labeled this dolphin dream time. 
And part of the picture was this golden light coming down into my being through the crown of my head and then shining out through my heart to the people in front of me. And I didn't know what this meant, but I knew that somehow it was connected to this dolphin dream time. And what dolphin dream time meant to me was the ability to talk to dolphins, the ability to commune with dolphins, to connect on a deep, deep level with dolphins. And so I had this drawing and I had these vague wisps of what does it mean? But I didn't know what to do again. And at this point, this dream had been with me now since I was a five-year-old living in Chicago, watching Jacques Cousteau, probably before that. I don't even know when I saw the first Dr. Doolittle movie, but I realized that it was time. And so even though this felt like an impossible dream, I knew I had to start taking steps forward and to, to do whatever I could to make this dream come true. So as I got more involved in teaching and academia and um, professional development, I actually started working with Skip and Jonathan at Encourse on the side. And these were two of the most extraordinary human beings I had ever met. And through our conversations, I, I came to realize that everything that I admired about them, they kept attributing back to a master's degree in spiritual psychology. They both had gone to the University of Santa Monica. They both had gone through the master's in spiritual psychology program. And I realized that that was my next step because when I looked at their website, right there on their website of the University of Santa Monica, they said, we help you make your dreams come true. I had this crazy dream and it wasn't coming true on its own. I needed some help. <laughs> so I enrolled at USM and I spent a year taking monthly spiritual psychology classes in Los Angeles, flying down to Los Angeles for one weekend every month, coming home and doing three work, three weeks of personal inner growth work. And I, I call this, it's kind of hard to explain USM and spiritual psychology, but I think the easiest way to describe going to school there is as an intense personal growth training. I was peeling away the layers of untruths that I had created about who I should be, who I was supposed to be, who I was. And with each issue healed, each untruth exposed and dissolved, what happened was I allowed myself to be me. And through that year of personal growth, what happened was that I reconnected with my childhood self, that little girl who knew that it was possible to be Dr. Doolittle, who knew that it was possible to commune with dolphins, who knew that it was possible to connect, to talk to, to communicate with all of life. And I had an epiphany on the last day of school that year. And I call this reconnecting or re-clarifying my personal truth that my younger self, my two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old self couldn't have put into words, but now as an adult, I could put into words. And so I stood up in front of my whole class and I said, I am a divine being having a human experience. This is my personal truth. And the other part of my personal truth was recognizing that every being is a divine being, but humans are here as divine beings to learn our spiritual lessons. And we're here to share our unique gifts in order to make the world a better place. This was the essence of how I saw our universe, how I saw myself and how I saw each person around me. Divine beings having a human experience in order to learn, to grow, to share, and to make the world a better place. 
So I want to back up for just a moment because here I was in this really amazing realization, this foundational moment for myself. But the other part of that year that I haven't told you about yet was when I enrolled at USM in order to start, start taking steps to make my dream come true, I also realized that I wanted to harness my natural intuitive abilities so that I could talk to animals, so that I could use my intuition to communicate intuitively with animals. And so I also enrolled in a one-year psychic training program. And I spent that year traveling to LA at one weekend a month, but every Monday evening I was back in class in Chico and I was learning intuitive skills and training. And in June of the next year, so here I am, I just finished my first year at USM, I finished my first year, my one year program in, um, in psychic training and I graduated from that program. My goal when I started that program was to be able to communicate intuitively with animals. And was I doing that? No. July went by. Was I talking to animals? No. August, talking to animals? No. September, was I talking to animals? Still no, WTF, like what was wrong with me? Why couldn't I do this? This was, I don't even know the words. It was beyond heartbreaking. This was like, now my dream was so close. I'd done everything I knew how to do to make this happen. And it still hadn't happened. So that was swirling around inside of me, this, this growing disease, this, this un, unease inside of me. And a really funny thing happened, um, which could have had tragic results. I'll admit it right up front. It could have been really, really bad, but thankfully it turned out well. But what happened was, here I was, it was the fall, I was getting ready to go back to my second year at USM and my husband um, was on the internet and he was for some reason doing research on USM where I've been attending school for a year and he found some information, <clears throat> excuse me, on the internet about a person who was associated with the school, but not really, like nobody who was directly related to the school and there was some article about this person that was somehow controversial. And so my husband, Chris, was telling me that USM is bad and I shouldn't trust it. And I, I, um, I, I needed to be more rigorous in, in my evaluation of it. And what was I doing there? And what if they were leading me astray? And I was just like, what? Are you freaking kidding me? And, and what my inner response was, was, why would you believe someone on the internet instead of me? I was like devastated. And I felt like I wasn't trustworthy. My direct experience wasn't worth anything. I wasn't a reliable source. I wasn't um, somehow worthy of, of evaluating the circumstances. My, opinion, my perspective didn't matter. And as I was saying all of these things to my husband, I felt like I was talking to my dad. In my body, I felt like this little kid who was like, why don't you see me? Why don't you listen to me? Why don't you trust me? And when I was a kid, my dad was a, a trial lawyer and the dinner table was like a courtroom. And having my dad ask me what happened today was like being on the witness stand. And I knew that no matter what I said, the next question was going to be who else was there? How can you prove that? So if I said it rained today, he would say, let's look at the weather channel, right? Like he would find some other way. He would never take my word for it. And 
as a child, I internalized this experience into an unconscious limiting belief that people don't believe me. Because here was my dad. He didn't believe me. If I said I saw a dog today, he would have to have like all the neighbors surveyed to see if they saw it too. So as I was working towards my dream of becoming an animal communicator, I thought that if I was an animal communicator, people would have to take my word for it, for the messages that I shared with them. And they would have to take my word for it that the message, messages that I shared from their animals were true. So I'm hoping that I'm, I'm telling this in a way that you can see how if I think people don't believe me, but people have to believe me in order to do this, this is not gonna work, right? These two things are in conflict. So because of my USM training, I was able to move through this and realize that my conversation with my husband was a trigger for a deeper issue that had been created in my childhood. I have also learned at USM that I create my beliefs. So in that moment, I went from arguing with my husband to reliving arguments with my dad to recognizing that we each create our reality with our thoughts. We each internalize our outer world and our experiences inside of ourselves that create our belief system. If I created those beliefs, I could uncreate them. And the way that they teach us to do that at USM is self-forgiveness. So in that moment, I forgave myself for buying into the limiting belief that I am not trustworthy. I forgave myself for buying into the limiting belief that people don't believe me. And as I did that and all of this angst dissolved inside of me and around me, I really affirmed the truth, which is I'm honest, I'm trustworthy. And I work hard with integrity to be accurate. And in my animal communication sessions today, I don't stop until I say, have you achieved your intention for our session? Do you have everything that you needed to get from this session? And that's who I was 10, 20 years ago, when this, 15 years ago when this all happened. So it was a pivotal, pivotal moment for me and side note, Chris and I did talk through this and work everything out. We're still married. Everything's all good. What could have been really horrible um, actually brought us closer together and, um, and worked in our favor. And I really, <clears throat> I now see this moment as divinely orchestrated to, have, to help me clear the block that I needed to clear in order to have my dream come true. And the next day, I was scheduled to go meet a friend and we were just <clears throat> having tea, hanging out. And I said, you know, I have this crazy dream. I might've said crazy ass dream because that's kind of how I talk. But I said, I have this crazy dream and I want you to help me. And I want to learn how to be an animal communicator. And she looked at me. And she said, I thought you were already doing that. That's totally who you are. And I was like, that's who I am? That's how you see me? <laughs> like, I haven't done this thing. Oh my God, you think that's who I am? And that was instantaneously because the next thing she said was, ask Bear why she's mad at my husband. Bear is her chihuahua. And I was like, oh crap, how do I do that? I've never done this before. What do I do? And she just looked at me and waited. And I had no choice. I closed my eyes and I just said, Bear, why are you mad at Kale, her husband? And poof, this image came into my head of Bear on the bed, looking at the bathroom door and Kale was coming out of the bathroom and he flipped off the light. And in that shadowy time, he looked huge like a monster. And there was a uh, bear on the bed, kind of scared and barky. And I was like, whoa. And so I, I told my friend Ellery, 
this is what I'm seeing. I, I don't know, but this is what I'm seeing. And she's like, that's exactly what happened. And I, my eyes were like, what? I just did this, you're kidding me. And, and she said, well, how can, how can Kale make it up to her? And I was like, okay, close my eyes again. And I just, in my mind, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just said, bear, how can Kale make it up to you? And we were sitting at Ellery's kitchen table. And in my mind, I saw that table and I saw Kale sitting at the table and I saw Bear on the floor next to him. And Kale was finishing up his morning cereal and he put the bowl of milk on the floor and gave it to Bear. And I thought, well, that can't be true because milk is bad for dogs. Nobody would give their dog milk. And so I waited for something more reasonable to come along. <laughs> And nothing did. And I was like, oh, crap. OK, well, OK, Ellery, I, I opened my eyes and I said, this is what I'm seeing. And she said, yeah, Bear loves his cereal milk. And that will totally resolve everything between them. And I'll tell him to give her his cereal milk. What? I, I was floored. I was astounded. I had been having this dream for 30 some years. I had been actively working for over a year to make this happen and poof, just like that, it happened. And I realized that it, it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had that breakthrough the night before. It wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been present and training and preparing for this moment. All of those things came together in that moment for that breakthrough to happen for me. So my next question for you is, what do you do when your dream comes true? Enjoy the hell out of it. Uh-huh. That is so right. Yes, you do. So I told my friend Michelle, oh my God, this thing happened yesterday with Bear and Ellery. Can you believe it? She's like, of course I believe it. Can you talk to dogs that aren't there in the room with you? Because my friend's dog, Sporty, is getting towards end of life and she doesn't know what to do and, and she really could use some help. And I was like, I don't know, can I? Let's find out. And so I tried it and I talked to Sporty and Sporty told me all about what was going on with her and had a message for her person. And um, one of the questions that Michelle's friend had was, what does she want me to do after she passes? And Sporty told me she wanted her ashes scattered underneath this specific tree in the backyard. And I was on cloud nine. I was like, this shit really works. Oh my God. So I, I was telling my, my close circle of friends. And uh, one day I was at my friend Deborah's house and I was walking down the hall and I was passing her dog, Molly. And just in that moment of passing in the hallway, I said, good morning, Molly. Did you have any good dreams last night? Not expecting anything to happen. I got dreams. I got dreams of a big beach with tons of sand and lots of scratching the back. I got a tree with a picture of her chasing squirrels in this tree. I was just, I was floating around in this new world and it was amazing. It was amazing. So I went back to USM for my second year and I'm still teaching at the college and you know my kids are still growing up they're like I don't know three and six at this point and life is a little bit crazy but I'm feeling really good and then they announce at USM we're going to do our second year project which I knew a second year project is a lot like a master's thesis. It's something you spend a lot of time on. You put your heart and soul into it. And I'm familiar with master's theses because I had a master's degree in biology. So I know that. But at USM, they do something a little bit different because it's not a science seed program. It's all about making your dreams come true. And so your second year project is your opportunity to make your dream come true. My dream was to write a book and share the messages from animals that I had received through animal communication. One of my classmates 
dreams was to become a jeweler and she made handmade jewelry. Um, and you know, there are all kinds of things, but, but this was mine and, and now I knew I could do it. So I kind of came back to second year, like on fire, like, let's go bring it on. And then they said, and we're gonna go public. You're gonna do a public presentation of your second year project. I was freaking terrified. What went on inside of me in that moment was total fight or flight. I froze and I didn't freeze just in that moment. I froze for a long, long time. Like I can't even breathe right now just thinking about it. Like my whole chest tightened up. The fear that that triggered inside of me was that everything else I had worked for was gonna be lost because I was gonna have to go public. My scientific colleagues would see me and they would judge me as being out there, crazy, bring on the white jacket, right? Like I was gonna lose the respect of my scientific community. And I had worked very hard for very many years to publish papers, to do toxic conferences. I had won awards. And my fear was that all of that was gonna be taken away. And it was, a very, very big fear. And it was actually grounded in a lot of experiences that did not make it very irrational, although it was, the degree of it was irrational, but um, I had had a lot of experiences with science and scientists who were not open-minded, who uh, were, were very judgmental and who were very limited in their understanding of the universe and the scope of what the world is about. So, the thing was, is that I loved science. I loved doing science. I loved learning science. I loved asking a question and getting an answer by being out in nature and watching animals. I loved this spiritual intuitive world that had just really exploded inside of me. I had both of those parts inside of me, but I felt like they were at war with each other. And I realized I didn't want to have to keep ping-ponging back between one and the other and having friends in this camp and friends in this camp and they never met and I couldn't talk about this stuff with this group of people. I didn't want to have to choose one or the other. And I needed to reconcile this for myself. And so you might not be surprised to hear that the solution that I came up with for myself was to conduct a scientific study on a spiritual topic. So as a biologist, I was trained in two quantitative methods for research. The first is experimental. So you actually do an experiment. And for an example, as a graduate student, I was part of a, a scientific study studying the metabolism of chuckwallas. And we did an experiment. We changed the diet composition for different groups of these individual desert lizards and then measured their metabolism and saw whether those changes had any effect on their metabolism. That's an experiment. When I did my PhD, I studied dolphin ecology in South Carolina and I observed the animals and I took notes and I gathered quantitative observations. So I counted the number of times I saw an animal. I counted the number of times that I saw them do this or with that other individual. Also quantitative observational research. Neither of those methods that I'd been trained in were going to work at this point. And so I expanded my repertoire of scientific methods. And I decided that I would use qualitative methods instead. And I was going to do case studies. And this is a technique that's very common in sociology, in psychology. And, um, and it will also show us the pattern. So you can still ask a question and get an answer. And that brings me back to my spiritual truth. Remember my spiritual truth? That we're humans. We're divine beings having a human experience and we have spiritual lessons to learn 
and unique gifts to share with the world. Well, the hypothesis that I chose was that animals are also spiritual beings with lessons to learn and gifts to share. And my method, my scientific method was gonna be to ask 10 different species of animals the same three questions so that I could compare these different case studies. And the animals were uh, bat, cat, dog, dolphin, elephant, horse, lion, owl, snake, and whale. A nice variety of animals. Although I don't see any insects in there. So a little bit limited. We're, we're definitely in the mammalian category here, except for the snake. Okay, um, so sorry, just a total biology aside there. So those were the animals that I chose. And the questions that I chose were, what is your spiritual gift? What is your spiritual lesson? And do you have a message that you wanna share with people? So, I went and I spent the next six or eight months asking these same questions to dozens and dozens of animals. And to my great relief, they, my results showed that my hypothesis was right. Animals are divine beings having, having their own unique butterfly or whale experience. And I have a, a quick excerpt I want to read from my book. So this is the book. This is my second year project in tangible form manifested. And um, I just wanted to read that this is what I wrote. If animals didn't have a spiritual lesson or gift, they would have answered me in a very different way. They might have said something like, huh, what are you talking about? Or just give me the kibble and nobody gets hurt or something like that, but they didn't. They knew exactly what I was asking them and they knew why they were here. I'm gonna leave it at that, um, just in, in respect for the time that we have here together. But what happened for me was in this process, I, I created a marriage within myself between these two, what I thought disparate parts of me, they now came together and they're now complementary, and I have access to both of them. And I can choose one or the other or both as needed, depending on my circumstances. So I resolve that conflict inside of myself. And what happened was I quit my job at the college and I started my business as an animal communicator. I was aligned inside and out now. And I've been a professional animal communicator for a dozen years. And I'm now spending a lot of my time teaching the next generation of animal communicators. And I wanted to share that story with you. I do have a few more minutes. MJ, are we okay? Okay. Um, so I wanted to share my, my story with you first for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, because I think my story kind of parallels the growth of our field of professional animal communicators in the Western world and, and actually around the planet. And that's what I wanna kind of shift into because the title of my talk is called Professional Animal Communication, Past, Present and Future. <laughs> so, so in a lot of ways, animal communication arose out of our, our nature, out of our nature as animals on this planet. It's inherent within us to have this ability. And many of us have lost track of that. And many of us globally, societally, right? We've, we've bought into um, all kinds of philosophical conundrums that just messed us up and industrialization and all kinds of limiting beliefs. But what happened in this field is that in the 70s, people like Penelope Smith found the way again. They found their way back. And between the 1970s to roughly 2000, I call this the first wave of professional animal communication. And I call these people the way showers. They showed us that it was possible. They showed us the way to 
heal our relationships with animals and the planet. They showed us that animal communication exists and that it's real. Um, most of these animal communicators were self-taught and then started teaching in small groups. And this was a kind of a localized phenomenon at the time. Of course, people were traveling to different countries, but it was still on a smaller scale at the time. Animal communication was mostly done in person or at, you know, maybe on the phone, but we didn't have any other technology at the time. And over those 30 to 40 years, the field grew slowly, it definitely grew. And um, as Penelope was demonstrating for us, writing those books was the greatest way to get that word out, to spread the word at the time. The second wave is what I call the innovators. And this is the phenomenon that I've seen between roughly 2000 and 2020. So that the next two decades, these are the, the animal communicators that I call the innovators. So now we know it's possible, but we're still kind of isolated. We're like these individual kernels of popcorn popping in our own place. And animal communication is definitely global, but it's still arising mostly independently. And now we have the internet. So the field is growing more quickly and many of the animal communicators are starting to work online. And because of this spread, animal communication is really becoming more mainstream, more accepted, simply because more people are doing it, more people are talking about it, and because it works. It's working to help people and animals with their problems and challenges that are important in their lives. It helps. So animal communication <clears throat> today is used for addressing pet behavior, helping aging pets, helping at end of life, talking to animals that have passed on um, in veterinary clinics with domesticated animals, with animal rescues, animal sanctuaries, with conservation and resolving conflicts between humans and wildlife. And now there are so many resources there are websites, there are books, there are YouTube videos, there's podcasts, there's online classes, there's in-person classes, there's um, summits online, there's symposiums like this one. And just to give you an example, I host the Animal Communicator and Healer Summit each year, and tens of thousands of viewers from over 70 countries and every continent except Antarctica have joined us for that. Animal communication is everywhere. And now we have MJ and her group documenting the phenomenon and identifying the factors that are influencing the spread of animal communication by recognizing the key ingredients for each individual becoming an animal communicator. And now with Victoria's research showing us what happens in an animal communication session and how that is a similar pattern across individuals. So we're really starting to understand the nuts and bolts and the science underneath the phenomenon of animal communication. So what's next? Well, what I call the third wave, I believe has already begun. So beyond 2022, this is what I call the groundswell. And the future that I envision is animal communicators in every town, every family, every humane society, every veterinarian's office, every rescue organization, every rehabilitation center, every animal sanctuary, everywhere, commonplace. In terms of con conservation, animal communicators can negotiate between humans and animals for mutually beneficial solutions to habitat encroachment and interaction challenges. And Winter Worsthorn is here and is actually doing a breakout session about this today. Um, and she'll be highlighting her research, her work with Baboon Matters and hopefully the White Lions in South Africa. Super, super important work. And this area really needs to grow. Um, obviously research and science is gonna be a great part of grounding animal communication in reality for the 
the greater population. It's going to strengthen the profession. And I encourage everybody to collaborate in whatever way they see fit. But perhaps the most valuable aspect of animal communication is going to be within the mindset of the humans. As humans, we're dependent on Earth's ability to sustain life. And right now, that ability is being threatened by outdated practices based on the misbelief of the superiority of humans over animals and the environment. With animal communication, there's a paradigm shift. And each new animal communicator sees herself, her world, and her role in the world differently. She sees herself as an integral part of the fabric of all life on Earth. And when this happens to enough individuals, the individual paradigm shift leads to societal changes, which can lead to local, state, national, and international policies and laws that are changed and updated. This paradigm shift is what we need to make this time in our history a pivot point where the scales start to shift in the direction of healing ourselves, our lifestyles, our ecosystems, our planet, and all of its inhabitants. So in conclusion, I've asked you so many questions. I wanna ask you one final question. And I want you to ask yourself this question. What can I do? As you ponder your answer, I'm gonna offer this perspective. Whatever is calling to you right now is what you can do. It doesn't have to be big, it doesn't have to be dramatic, but if you can identify just one step you can take today and then take that step, if we each do that, we just might change our future and we might save ourselves and our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. Um, I just saw a last comment coming in from Heidi, who is a graduate student and says, that's why I'm here. Um, um, and I want to give a shout out to all the, I mean, I have to do this, I'm a researcher, to all the graduate students and postdocs who have been with us, um, because you have a really, really important leadership role to play. And to Kara, thank you for having the courage to share your journey. And I, I know a lot of it resonates with others who've been on this path um, in parallel um, to yours. And I want to acknowledge that um, this healing process of relationship with the natural world and with the animals that you've highlighted is a central part of this journey. And I like the way that you highlighted the role of animal communicators in the profession of animal communicators, which is a unique and very special body of um, a group, a collective of individuals on these journeys, who at this time, I think are in a really important position to um, align with and intersect with in ways that indigenous peoples will give us guidance about. Um, how, do, how does our understanding at this time support the deep knowledge traditions of Indigenous peoples that have been carried through and that they have been the caretakers of? So I think there's a, a real potential for beautiful alignment and a lot of learning um, for people like me and, and us to do in terms of how do we do that in a really good way. So, I, I mean, you've, you've laid some really helpful and important groundwork for future journeys together. I do want to highlight just a couple other things said and, and give some time for questions. Um, truth. You talked about truth. And I, I went back to my notes from uh, Rosalind's uh, presentation yesterday and her quote from Einstein, you must not conceal any part of what one has recognized to be true as a key theme that kept coming up forward again and again in your talk. Also, the idea of alignment. And it made me think of... Um, in, Indigenous Hawaiian scholar Manu Meyer, who talks about the triangulation of meaning and the many, many traditions across the world, including our, her own as an Indigenous scholar, that bring together and value the importance of mind, body, spirit, all as ways of knowing. 
and uh, I just want to close with um, the the stories you tell about, or this in particular story about moving beyond blocks, is a really important part of my own scholarly inquiry, and um, I look forward to pursuing that further with those who are interested in doing that.